you know off the beat, south, 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 you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't think it would. Uh, I can remember things back that far, but I, I was listening to your um, your podcast with Brian the other day, and it's it's just so funny all the different stories he was telling. It 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 brought back uh, a lot of those memories. So, it was, believe it or not, surprisingly, uh, my, my memory is pretty good about a lot of that. <laughs> nice. Well, we're gonna test that out. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so are you originally from Ruston? Well, not originally. I grew up uh my dad worked for the uh for the government, so we were we were kinda all around. But I I moved to Ruston um when I was in let's see, it was seventh grade, so it would have been about eighty four, eighty five ish. So it was uh, right around there. And were you already playing music uh, by the time you were in seventh grade? No, actually, believe it or not, uh, I just, you know, I'd always been into music, uh, you know, of course, like like most people that, that uh, got into uh, punk and, and hardcore and everything at a, at a certain time. My my listening tastes weren't all that great, you know, in 83, 84, it was mostly like, you know, Duran Duran and, uh, you know, it had kind of skewed uh, you know, the Eagles, uh, War album, and everything. So, I, I, I was uh, musically, I was, I was a very musical person. But uh, it wasn't until I moved to uh, Weston that um, we, uh, it was basically a, a friend of mine that I went to high school with, Jim uh, Rosenquist. Who was, uh, he's one of those guys that always uh, was drumming on his desk with his fingers at school and. Uh, drumming on textbooks and, you know, kind of like you hear the, the stories of, you know, Tony Lee talking about how he would always hit uh, pots and pans with wooden spoons and stuff. You know, Ben was always like that. And just one day he was like, hey, we, you know, we should start a, we should start a band. And, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't really play any musical instruments at the time. So, but my dad had a, uh, a bass and, um, he was a big, um, a musician, kind of, not professionally, but in his spare time, he would play like jazz and stuff like that. He actually had like these uh, Roland DX7 keyboards, and he he had uh, like these MIDI sequencers and stuff. So he would just kind of sit in the bass and play jazz and stuff. So I uh, I grabbed his bass when he wasn't looking, and because um, I figured it was the, it was the most uh, nothing against bass players, but I figured it was the most simple thing to 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 learn. Uh, quickly, because you didn't, you know, you didn't have to, uh, with a bass, you don't really have to form, uh, you know, chords with your fingers and, and those sorts of things. So I, I just learned really fast just because we wanted to, uh, to put a band together. Well, four strings is easier than six, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, you know, with bass strings, you can just pound on the string, you know, hitting one note at a time. You know, you don't have to start out like uh, like like Getty Lee or anything. You know, uh, you could just start and start pretty easy. So that's yeah, I kind of just ran with it. So you guys were playing over at your house, like your your dad had uh, like a, like a place for you guys to play, or where where yeah. were you jamming that early on? Yeah, we had a you know, I lived in a uh, I lived in a townhome and in, in in the. the uh, the basement. That's where my dad had kind of his uh, his music room. It's kind of like Brian was telling the story about. Uh, I forget whose dad it was. It, 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 it might have been Mike's, but someone someone's dad was like, "Oh, you got free too much free time. You know, I'm going to teach you to do." It was kind of like the same thing with us. You know, we were, uh, you know, Ben uh, was always drumming on his desk, so he was he was clearly going to be a drummer, and then. You know, I grabbed the the bass from my my dad's, uh, and he had a bass amp uh, in my music room, and so uh, me and uh, Ben just started kind of, you know, even though we had no um, 
no uh, history with writing songs or music or anything like that. We just started coming up with stuff. And he actually bought um, – I, I may be jumping ahead in the in the narrative here, but, but um, I, I, you, and, you and Brian had talked about Doug Crosby, who was – the uh, the drummer for and he was the original drummer for Avail. Well, he recently, uh, right around that time, had gotten a uh, bought a new drum kit, and he had this old uh, Tama, uh, or was it Tama? I, I I can't recall, but it was his old kit, and he was trying to unload it, you know, for like a couple hundred bucks, just trying to get rid of it real quick. So so Ben bought. Doug's uh, old drum set, and that's kind of what we uh, what we started out with. So, so Ben had uh, Doug Crosby's old drum set. I had my dad's bass, and we. Uh, I, I guess it was a good thing because me and Ben were best friends, and you know, you, you always hear about in in in, uh, in bands how the uh, how the the bass and the drums kind of have to be in sync. You know, you're the rhythm section. So, uh, I guess it was kind of all worked out that that we just started uh, him and I just started jamming together. And uh, you know, coming up with 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 stuff. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a good basis for anybody else to be added to the the thing later on after you guys have developed, you know, a certain synchronicity with one another and uh, right chemistry. Right. So so when did you add other guys? When did uh, Pat come into the group? Well, we uh, okay. So we started, you know. Uh, just at Ben's house and my house, we just started jamming, coming up with ideas. And, and Ben and I had uh, more so Ben ahead of me, but but we had started getting into uh, you know punk and hardcore around that time. You know, we we started out uh, <laughs> around that time. It was you know it, at least for us, we started listening to kind of the the funny punk songs at first. You know, we just because they um you know they, the lyrics were so hilarious so we we would listen to like uh suicidal tendencies you know institutionalized you know oh my oh mom i just want a pepsi and you know i was in my room and i was just like staring at the wall thinking about everything then yeah i was thinking about nothing and then my mom came in and i didn't even know she was there she called my name and i didn't hear her then she started screaming mike mike and i go what what's the matter she goes what's the matter with you i go there's nothing wrong mom she goes don't tell me that you're on drugs I go, no, Mom, I'm not on drugs. I'm okay, I'm just thinking, you know. Why don't you give me a Pepsi? She goes, no, you're on drugs. I go, Mom, I'm okay, I'm just thinking. She goes, no, you're not thinking, you're on drugs. No, no, people don't act that way. I go, Mom, just give me a Pepsi, please. All I want is a Pepsi. And she wouldn't give it to me. All I wanted was a Pepsi. Just one Pepsi. And she wouldn't give it to me. Just a Pepsi. Give me my shirt with my sleeve. We were listening to Circle Jerks and uh, um, the Meat Men, which was you know local, uh, somewhat local to uh, to rest in you know DC and everything, and so um, so we started getting into that. But then, really, the first thing that kind of kicked in you know high gear for us was right around the, the same time in uh in um late 85 we started getting into rights of spring and uh dag nasty which uh you know now of course because of fagazi everyone knows about rights of spring but you know they were they were pretty big uh in the dc scene there and also in the the suburbs and everything and been kind of gravitated towards that because uh, you know, anyone who's listened to Rights of Spring, the the drums are so, you know, they're they're crazy. I mean they're they're even mic crazy. I was the champion of the death of the death, but I haven't found a way to forgive you yet. And I know you and I are through. Wish Sometimes a man will blind 
the drums were crazy, so so Ben really gravitated towards that. I gravitated towards uh Dag Nasty pretty big time. They had just uh in in eighty six they had just come out with uh the Can I Say album and, and that that totally, you know, changed my life. I was just totally into that. And so uh so that's kinda where we were coming from. So we uh we were like, Man, we need to get a uh you know, guitar player, singer, you know. Where did where play. did you where'd you find that music like where they weren't playing it on the radio so where did you yeah. discover those bands from it, it, it's interesting you know it, being in the rest and scene you know I, i've tried to think of whether it was the proximity to dc or whether it was just you know i'm sure that had to play into it because you know uh, everyone was getting in, into uh dc bands in rest and so i don't recall how um, Ben started getting into Rice of Spring. That that might be a, if we ever get a hold of Ben, that might be a, a Ben story. But but I know Dag Nasty for me was uh, Ben had a best friend named Dave Hogan who uh, who lived near I can't remember his name, but he was he was just a neighborhood friend of Dave Hogan's who somehow knew the guys in uh, in Dag Nasty when they had first gotten together. This is when they had. Uh, Sean Brown singing for him before before Dave uh, before Dave Smalley got into the band and they they hadn't even I, I think they either had just recorded their uh, nine song demo uh, with Sean uh, which they they were actually going to release it as a one or two six inches on Discord but then of course they dropped the whole thing when when Dave got into the band and um, they they re recorded the album but um. But they were, uh, they had either just recorded it or were just about to record their, all their, their demos with Sean. And, uh, they, one day they were, uh, they were pressing shirts. They were, uh, silk screening shirts at this friend's house. And so, uh, this friend of Dave Hogan, who was, Dave Hogan was a friend of, you know, Ben, who was the, my best friend, the, the, the drummer, um, he got a hold of one of these shirts and, uh, I think he was just borrowing it or the, the friend lent it to him or something. Eventually he, he kept it and it was, it was his, which I was always mad about that because, you know, he, Ben wasn't as, as into Dag Nasty as I was and I, I was pretty mad that he got to keep that shirt. But, uh, but anyway, so that, that kind of started the whole thing. We saw this shirt and we were like, Oh, that's a band. Yeah. Who's, who's in that band? And they were like, well, it's actually the guitar players, uh, Brian Baker that used to, to, uh, play bass from, for, well, and guitar for Minor Threat. And I was like, minor threat? Who's minor threat? And so, you know, we we kind of started digging into it, to everything. And it's, you know, it's the same old story. The guy who got the shirt then had a cassette tape of the Sean Brown demos for Dag Nasty. And we started listening to that. And so, it, you know, immediately when the uh, the Dave Smalley, uh, the, the Can I Say album came out, you know, we immediately snatched that up because by then we knew who Dag Nasty was.
you, you know how it is. Once you have like one band or uh, you know two bands or so in a certain scene, like on a certain label like Discord, you start diving into everything on Discord and everything in that scene. And so that's that's that was kind of you know uh, our turning point for for just. Uh, getting into everything and that's kind of really what drove us you know which is like man we need to we need to get a guitar player and a singer and we need to start uh you know recording music doing shows you know doing everything it was we you know kind of like brian was talking about on on your podcast you know once once you kind of get the uh the uh the it you know it's like it just it just you just want to move on it immediately and so where'd you find the other the other guys you were about to tell me before yeah, yeah, uh we it was just as simple as we need to find you know someone who can sing or scream or whatever and then we need to find a guitar player. So we fa- we got Pat who we just knew from school, you know. I I think I heard you mention in your previous podcast or whatever you went to to Langston Hughes and then to uh South Lakes. Well, you know, Ben and I were at Langston Hughes when we started hanging out. And so was Pat Kennedy, and so was uh, Jason Radley, who's the, the the guy we eventually got to play guitar. But um, you know, we we kind of all were in all the same circles with with you know Brian was a, I think he was a year older than Ben and I, Ben Pat and Jason. Ben Pat and Jason and I we were all in the same grade, so Brian was a year ahead of us. And like uh, you know, Joe Banks and Doug were like one to two years ahead of us in school, so they were a little bit older than us, but. You know, we started finding out about the whole, you know, emerging music scene. I think Brian mentioned that, you know, Pudwack had been around, which they went on to form Foundation, so we had heard about them. But then the really first band that we heard about was uh, and we had any access to them, and the rest of them was Stacks. And so we we kind of just started knowing everybody there. So we got Pat. Um, Pat was, uh, believe it or not, Pat was big into – Kind of like me, you know, his he was more of a mainstream guy, and then all of a sudden, you know, being in that area and with everyone that we went to school with or whatever, he started getting into, like, minor threat, and, you know, he he went straight from, you know, David Lee Ross, Eat Him and Smile to, you know, minor threat. But uh, but anyway, we you know, he, he was coming up with a bunch of lyrics. I don't know if he was a big, uh, like, a poetry guy or if he just wanted to start writing lyrics just. To uh, to make songs specifically or whatever, but anyway, we got uh, we you know just by knowing him and going to school with him, or whatever. He was like he was like yeah, you know I've got some some lyrics and some stuff, and you know I can you know he couldn't really sing, but he could scream really. You know he had a good. Uh, I mean you've heard the demo. He kind of had a kind of a young Ian MacKay kind of scream, you know, and so he was he was he was totally on board for it. But the, yeah, the hard thing was finding a guitar player because. You know, with punk music, you can, you can, or hardcore, you can kind of go one of two ways. You can get some guy who's just a noisy guitar player who, you know, maybe he's not the greatest guitar player, but, you know, he can, he can do the power chords and, you know, is noisy or whatever. Or you can try and find someone like, you know, like a, like a Brian Baker or a Dr. No or somebody who, you know, they may be, you know, noisy, but you, but you can tell they've, they've, they've got like musical training, you know, they can do guitar solos and stuff like that. So we, you know, we, we just wanted anybody that <laughs> we just wanted to start a band. So we were like, anybody that can play guitar, we'll grab them. And we, we met, uh, Jason Radley in school and he, um, he was a guy, he was big into like classic rock, you know, he could do the guitar solos. He was all, you know, uh, the the Hendrix stuff, Led Zeppelin. You know, he was more classic, but he had this big desire to to just be in a band. Also, he just wanted to play music. So uh, he was like, "Well, you know, I, I don't really know too much about punk, but you know, I'll, I'll I'll sign up and we'll just, you know, we'll just see what the four of us can do." And so, um, what? What was like your your first show? How did that transition into like actually playing in front of people? Well, you know, we we started uh, we we you know we needed a place. Even to, before to that, what was the, what was the first song where where it all clicked? Uh, actually, you know, <laughs> that's kind of a funny story, but you know how a lot of punk bands one of the one of the one of the signature things they do is they always seem to write like a song that has the name of the band as the name of the song. So, you know, you've got your marginal man, you know, you've got 
uh, you know, minor threat, just a minor threat. You know, everyone, they all seem to write that song that is the name of the band. So that was our, our first song. I was like, well, you know, I forget who brought up the name. Did you Hustle have the name of the band first or you wrote the song and then you were like, we should name the band that because that's our signature song. You know, you know, I'm a little fuzzy on which which one came first, but I want I want to say the the that Pat had the idea for the name, and then and also the lyric. You know, at, at kind of around the same time, and, and we just thought the name was cool. You know, because you could uh, you could shorten it, you could do you know the initials H E, and you know that was good to write everywhere and put on flyers. And everything. So, and I think it just came at the same time, so we um, we wrote that song you know hostile environment and uh and it just it e- e- even though it wasn't like it didn't have the really fast you know hardcore beat but it was it was kind of more of a of a sex pistols kind of you know rhythm to it um it just you know that it just kind of really set it off and we were, we were all like man you know that sounds really it was really simple you know very very simple even by punk standards but um we just thought it sounded so cool from there we, we were practicing in the basement of um there's this girl we went to high school with named betsy nord and uh she was a, a, like a year older than, than us and she actually was dating uh joe banks uh who at that time had not started a veil yet because we're talking about 80 1986 right now so um you know he he had obviously played guitar and sleeve sax and then they had recently broken up or no they were they were still together right at this time but anyway, he was dating this girl named Betsy Nord, and so we stashed all of our gear in her basement, and uh, we practiced there, and we just would go there every day uh, after school, you know, play music, and then once we had like three, four, five songs together, Joe uh, Banks was like, man, you know, I, I'd like to record this stuff. This is really cool, because he was kind of just hanging out uh, with, with Betsy at the time, so he he brought over his, uh, he had a, like a four-track Radio Shack realistic mixer, and it yeah. Was like he, yeah, he would, you know, he would try and, you know, we only had a couple mics, you know, so he would try and kind of mic everything the best he could, and it was it would go into those four tracks, so it was like one mic would be in front of the the entire drum kit, you know, and then one sure. mic would be in front of uh, in front of the, the, the guitar amp, one mic in front of the bass amp, and then you know Pat held the fourth mic. All of those went into the real exit mixer, uh, and then he would just plug that into a, a boombox, and, uh, and and you know put on headphones and just he would he'd tell us to play for two or three minutes and he'd kind of keep mixing while we were playing till it sounded like it was mixed you know somewhat okay and then he was like all right you know start start playing all your all, every song you know and we'll record the uh, the demos. Punk rock man. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. So, um, just uh, about the name, just just one more thing. Did you consider like like Reston to be a hostile environment towards you know towards towards kids, towards teens, towards musicians? Uh, it, in some respects, yeah. I mean, you know, we didn't 
we didn't have a lot, you know, I don't know if you've seen the, the Salad Days documentary about DC. We, you know, uh, there was definitely tensions between, you know, like any high school, you have the, you know, you have the jocks and you have the, the gangs and, you know, the metal heads. And then uh, we didn't really have a skinhead, you know, problem in, in, uh, in South Lakes, but then you had the punks and everything. So while, you know, while people would get into your normal, you know, high school fights and stuff, um, it, it, it wasn't a very violent, you know, uh, school scene or anything like that. You know, th- you know, of course, you know how it is, uh, everyone was in Weston, you know, if you're, if you're on a bike path late at night, you know, there's, you, you never know if you're going to get jumped by somebody or whatever, you know, for whatever reason. But, um, that was kind of just normal stuff, you know, probably the only, the, uh, the only thing, and maybe this, this probably had something to do with it, but the only kind of, real hostility we were uh, uh receiving at the time was just was more for uh because we all except for jason jason wasn't a skateboarder but we all skated and you know around that time it was like you know everybody you know all the storefronts up at you know uh uh, uh you know up by kemp mill records or whatever you know i mean you, you technically you couldn't skate like anywhere you know everyone was kicking the skateboarders out and no loitering and you know, the Rest and Home Association, ROA, would, uh, you know, if somebody put, like, a little street ramp to, to skate on, and you know, in their uh, cul-de-sac or whatever, they would come down and crack on that. So, but that was probably, it was probably our biggest, uh, uh, you know, quote-unquote hostile environment was the, just the um, people just so against skateboarding and then, you know, uh, by extension, not just skateboarding, but, you know, it was mainly punks and, you know, stuff that we're skating and everything. So it was, yeah, we, we, we did receive a lot of, uh, you know, I guess it, less violence, but more like, you know, looks and, and, uh, you know, people just against that whole, uh, uh, kind of lifestyle and aesthetic, you know, the skating, the punk rock, everything like that. Yeah. It's funny how, how that shifted in like society oh. and how, um, uh, mainstream skating has has become it yeah it cracks me up because you know i've got just like brian i've got uh i don't know how many kids brian has but i I, i've got a a couple kids and you know you go to (laughs) you go to the mall and it's like you know half the the teens you run into are wearing vans and like i I don't know if it's if it's the same where, where you are now but in the last like year or two like 75% 75% of the kids I see walking around have a magazine t-shirts. I mean, it's, you know, it's insane. It's, it's like, it's, you know, it's a cool thing. You know, I mean, it was, it was cool even back in the 80s uh, and, and early 90s, but, you know, it's, it's like a mainstream cool now. And a lot of towns have the, you know, uh, the, the skate parks you can go to and everything, you know, I mean, of course, back in, back in those days in California, you know, you had skate parks everywhere, but in the rest of the country, that was kind of a, you didn't see a lot of that. And so, uh, yeah, even here in Texas, you know, my, my kid goes out and skates, at the, you know, they have a skate, uh, a public skate park with, you know, pools and everything. It's just, it's crazy how, how uh, mainstream it is. Yeah. We would have killed for that shit in Reston too. Oh, we used to have, <laughs> I, I remember I, I remember Ryan talking, I keep referencing the podcast with Brian. So I, I hope there's, there's not a lot of people listening to this going, what is he talking about when he keeps saying Brian? But anyway, if anybody has listened to it, they need to listen to your uh, your podcast from just from a, a week or two ago. But you know, he was talking about the whole, uh, you know, when he was ma- when him and Brian McCracken would make uh, the stage with the milk crates and the plywood, and that that yeah. got me that got me thinking about how we, you know, there were so many um, construction sites around Reston, you know, building townhomes and uh, apartment complexes and houses and stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to say that I was, uh, uh, as, as good of a, uh, you know, a good of a, a punk as Brian was, you know, where he was talking about the milk crates, but then returning them. But we, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, we didn't have the option of buying, uh, taking plywood and making, you know, skateboard ramps and then, you know, disassembling the ramps and returning them. So we, uh, unfortunately, yeah. we it, it was pretty gold. expensive to get it from Heckinger's, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we just, we just basically straight up stole plywood, and we would we would literally go, you know, you would take a bike path to some area in the woods that was just in the middle where like nobody could access it unless they knew where they were going, and then you would we would build 
like half pipes in the middle of the woods, and uh, they'd be these secret locations or whatever. And you'd even, you would even spray paint on them, you know, Roa Western Homeowners Association. Roa sucks, you know, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and so uh, it was, yeah, it was very, you know, it, 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 we would set up ramps just pretty much every, everywhere we could, you know, secret little ramps in the middle of the woods somewhere. So, um, get, getting back to your shows, like when when you actually started playing for people as hostile environment, what was the the reaction, and and how yeah. did it make you feel? Yeah, we were, you know, we we you know, Joe was recording those demos for us, but it wasn't, you know, a lot of bands are like, you know, they want to record so they can put stuff out, and at that time since there weren't a lot of bands, you know, uh, putting out, you know, they weren't doing seven, seven inches or tapes or anything, you know, at least in the rest of the area, at least not yet. Um, so those, those demos were kind of just for like us and people we went to school with and, you know, you'd pass on tapes and stuff. So that was like the whole demo thing. And then we were at a certain point when we had, you know, enough songs, we were like, man, you know, it'd be really cool to, like uh play a show or whatever and you know of course what we were thinking of is you know we're not thinking like you know hey you know let's get big enough to where we can go into dc and play at you know uh the black cat or 9 30 club or whatever you know obviously that was like some kind of way off goal that we could have never even Pipe dreamed dream. of but we <laughs> yeah we but but we were like we just want to play and it's like okay locally what can we do and so we were like you know let's we could that's when you know uh uh Brian and uh and uh, Brian McCracken and Brian Stewart and everybody they they started coming up with these ideas of doing the shows in the garages and, and you know someone's parents were out of town it was kind of like the whole you know 16 candles uh you know movie where you have like 200 kids in a house or whatever but at least in our version it was you know it was there to to go there and to to see the music and everything so we started we, we did that in my house you know, yeah. <laughs> my house was one of those houses later on, like like ten years later. You know, oh, wow. my house was that house. I hope it survived. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, it, it's amazing how little stuff got broken or <laughs> or stolen. There's, there's, there's a funny story from um, from my friend, this kid Tim Waite, where um, he he threw one of those parties at his house. And people were walking out of his house with like couches and furniture. Oh, like they're just terrible. taking it out of his house, and he had to call nine one one on his own party. Oh my gosh, that yeah, that is that's crazy. Well, luckily we didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of that going on. I know uh, there was one show, and I think this is the show that I, I sent you uh, either the link or the files to or whatever, and it was at Stan uh, Havistus's house, which. I think Brian mentioned him in, in your previous podcast, but he, I don't know if his parents were out of town or whether it was just an afternoon where, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what the circumstances were, but yeah, we had, uh, we had a lot of people at that one and, you know, some holes got kicked in the wall and stuff, you know, and I always felt really bad about that because I, I don't know, I wouldn't want that happen into my house. So I, you know, I was always trying to, to be pretty re- respectful of everyone's house, but it, it was amazing, you know, uh, where you'd get, it was it was getting you know maybe I'm getting ahead of myself we you know we would get uh, we didn't have enough songs we had at that time we had like maybe six seven songs so we're like okay we need to we need to find somebody to play you're with. like that that'll last about ten minutes it, exactly so <laughs> so you know we we got to find you know more people on the bill here and that's when we just through people we knew at school uh, we we found out about LDK learning disabled kids. And, I, I, you know, I really don't recall whether they started a little bit before us or maybe a little bit after us. But but at the time, uh, at the time we were starting, it was like Sleefax was just ending. And really us and LDK were the only, at that moment in time in 86, we were the only, uh, the, the only two games in town, really. And so every party or show or whatever, it was always, you know, LDK and hostile environment. And it was, you know, it, it, it would, it, it got to be kind of funny because, you know, you'd, you'd go to a show or a party or whatever, uh, and every time it would be the same two bands. It's like, hey, it's LDK and Hostile Environment again, you know, but, uh, but it, and it was like Brian was talking about, you know, we had, a, a 
we had the ping system that everyone kind of passed around. And then, uh, you know, we would set up like LDK's uh, drum set. And I, and I think Brian mentioned that Tim Barry was the drummer for LDK at that point, who, you know, he later went on to go sing for Avail after Brian. But uh, we would, you know, his drum set would be set up. And then uh, Mike Munoz, the guitar player for LDK, our guitar player would use his amp. He would just plug his, you know, guitar into it. And uh, and then I would use the, the – so it was kind of like, you know, the setup was there for the for both bands, but we would just – we would both use the same uh, – like, like a back line. Like a back line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. And Tim, Tim Berry had this weird – I don't know if you know what a China symbol is, but uh, – yeah. Tim Barry had yeah. it's one of those upside down symbols that when you hit it it, it almost sounds like a like a like a, gong. a light version of a gong kinda. Of. Yeah. But he <laughs> I don't know I don't know what the deal was, you know. That is not had, punk, that is not very punk rock. <laughs> it no, it was not punk and, and even Ben and his his uh drum set, just because at the beginning he, he was piecing together a drum set from Doug's old set and some other things. But uh, Ben actually had some roto toms in his set instead of uh regular toms. So it sound, kind of sounded like if you ever listen to the Meatman album uh, War of the Superbikes, when that guy does a drum roll, you hear these all these like go go toms, and uh, you know Ben had some go go toms, and then that China symbol. If you listen to that live uh, show at fans, you'll you'll hear every once in a while Ben will hit the uh, the China symbol, and it's so out of place because you know, you're playing this the, you're playing the song that sounds like you know Minor Threat, and then all of a sudden you read you know like it's you know, freaking uh, Alex Van Halen back there or something. It, it, it's hilarious. <laughs> Well, I guess I guess if you got it, you might as well use it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, we used it, but yeah, we we just used the same setup. The good thing you and, didn't uh, have wind chimes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm surp- I'm surprised we never did do uh, did wind chimes or whatever. But yeah, we we kind of were just it was for like close to a year. It was just LDK and House Environment, and every show was just us two. And then, but then all of a sudden in eighty early 87 that's when everything seemed to kick in and I think what had happened is a lot of people we went to school with had been going to these shows and saw that you know uh, not to, not to sound crazy but you know they were like man this this doesn't look that hard you know LDK they were much better musicians than we were um, and they they had way more intricate 
um, you know, later on they did some demos at Inner Ear that just, you know, you listen to and you're like, wow, you know, this is really good stuff. But, it, you know, at the time it was all kind of rudimentary and um, just like, you know, most good punk rock is. And, and I think a lot of people in rest and a lot of kids we went to school with were like, man, you know, if they're doing this, we can do this. So that's when all of a sudden things just, other bands just started popping up everywhere. Not, not because like, you know, like we were some kind of godfathers of the scene or whatever. It's they, I think just people, after a certain amount of shows, gone to see both LBK and Austin Island, they eventually were like, man, you know, if we if we kind of come up with our own thing and come up with some songs or whatever, you know, maybe we can start playing some of these shows and stuff. And that's that's kind of what happened. You know, you had a, uh, you know, you had Not Head with Dave uh, and uh, Carter Blitz, who's, who's now drumming in uh, JFA. He's been drumming for JFA for years, but. You know, they started playing shows, and there was this one band called uh, Transillions that popped up, where they were more of like, they were kind of like the rush uh, of the scene. They were they were playing like some really intricate like prog classic kind of rock, and there was Terracator and Friends, and this band called Crunchy Water, which they were they were straight up like classic rock. You know, they had the the long hair in it, but but I mean, everyone kind of even though it wasn't all you know, exactly uh, punk. Everyone, you know, got along great and everyone was just like, you know, we didn't care how many bands or what kind of music it was or whatever. It was just, everyone just wanted to, you know, just play. Yeah, well, that, that's what I think is awesome about the scene and that's, that, that's the thing about this show too is um, it's not just a, 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 it's not for just punk rock or rest and hardcore, you know? This is yeah. about the, the the diversity of music that actually came out of Reston, and yep. Yep. Uh, you know, and the, and the fact that it was a scene that was welcoming to uh, a lot of different kinds of stuff. I mean, I don't know about you, you know, I I like punk and I, I like hardcore, but I also listen to a lot of other stuff too. You know, oh, I, yeah. I I I listen to hip hop, I listen to jazz, I listen to funk, I listen to classic rock. I like DC Go Go. I like you know a, oh, yeah. a lot of di- of different kinds of music. So yeah, and I, and, I and, and the thing is, I like all of those bands. I like um, you know Crunchy Water used to rehearse in um, in Cater's household, which was up the street from um, my best friend on okay. uh, on, w- on Wake Robin Lane. So oh, wow. we would be, we'd be playing we'd be playing street hockey out there, and they would be going at it in the basement, and that's how I knew Crunchy Water, right? You know, yeah. I, and, and and I was friends with with Jake Cater, and so okay. you know Aaron and Gabe and and those guys were were his older brothers. So it was like oh, oh wow. his, his older brothers like Janet. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was. That's one of the great things about the music scene is is uh, you know everyone definitely had their own uh, taste, but you know everyone was very tolerant of whatever music they wanted to play. You know, I mean, you you know you might make fun of it sometimes. Like we a lot of times we would make fun of uh, you know Jason, our guitar player. You know, we'd make fun of it because he'd want to stick a guitar solo in or whatever, and we're like, oh, you know, you're just you're just, you know, you're into that classic rock and everything, you know, you, you, you know, we're doing punk though, you know, so I mean, you make fun of people and everything, but everyone was very tolerant of what everything, you know, everything that was, was, was going on at the time, you know, we even had, uh, it was funny. The classic rock is awesome. Hen- oh yeah, oh yeah, awesome. yeah. Led Zeppelin is awesome. The Rolling Stones. Yeah, I listened awesome. to some of our old old demos. I, I don't know if you listened to the whole the whole demo, Hustle Environment demo I sent you, but near the end of it, it was one of the very first songs we ever did, and uh, it was I think it was called Cop Suck, which you know, great hardcore uh, uh, title there, but it even had this crazy uh, classic rock guitar solo in the middle. <laughs> time we were like this this is awesome you know but uh, you know of course now you listen to it and it's it's so out of place but i mean it it was great you know um the guys in ldk like tim berry it's so funny you know just later on when he uh sang for a veil 
and you know you're looking at the you know the uh the albums that the avail albums that came out later on 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 lookout and then fat rack and everything you know uh you know tim berry's this you know there there's the whole uh, you know after avail moved to richmond they had you know this whole kind of aesthetic this richmond aesthetic you know like the the hats and the, you know i mean i don't think they were trying to go for this aesthetic but it just it is what it, it was what it was and they, but but when they when Tim was in LDK and he was the drummer for LDK, he was like at the time he was a super metalhead. Like he he hung out. You know the bass player for LDK was this guy named Tim Moskey, and uh, and then Tim Berry was the the drummer, and they were both Chris like Moskey. super metal. Chris Moskey, yeah, not not yeah. His brother was I, I think his brother Tom. was Tom Tom Moskey. So yeah, so yeah, Chris Moskey. And they they were both like super metalheads, you know. They had the the the, the metalhead hair. They had they wore the uh, you know the jean jackets with the or it was the leather jacket with the jean jacket over it, but with the arms cut off kind of a thing, <laughs> you know. And then on yeah. the back, you know, sewn sewn onto the back was like you know Metallica killed them all and stuff like that. So even though it, they were part of the, the the hardcore you know punk scene, playing in LDK, both Chris and Tim were huge, you know, like DRI, uh, you know, um, Sepultura, you know, Metall- early Metallica, you know, they were, they were big into like metal metal and they were, it was hilarious because you'd have all these, these kids at the parties, like, you know, Pat, our singer, uh, when we started Hustle Environment, he was, he was a big straight edge guy, you know, Minor Threat was his thing, Ian McKay was his, was his guy. Um, he was like, you know, he, he smoked, but he was like, I'm, you know, I'm not drinking, I'm not doing drugs, I'm not doing any of this, I'm, I'm straight edge, you know, ups on the hand and everything. But then, you know, sitting right next to him, you'd have, you know, Chris and Tim, and they, you know, they, they plow through like a case of Bush beer themselves before LDK even <laughs> went on to, to play, you know. And I was always amazed. For some reason, it was always Bush beer, but they would. Literally every show we played with LDK, it was it was it was Tim and Chris that just had all this stash of Bush beer, and they would just plow through it. You know, it was amazing. Yeah. But yeah, that was the thing. You know, you, the straight edge and the the kids that partied and everything. Everybody at that time in the music scene, you know, uh, eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight, even eighty nine, everyone just got along, and it was all just like everyone just wanted to play shows and hang out and. You know, some of the guys were were drinking and, and and doing drugs, and some of the other guys were like, "No, I'm straight edge." It was it was fine. It was like, "Ah, whatever." You know, we all just still hung out. Well, how do you remember the uh, the jams for man like invite coming to you guys and and that whole thing coming together? Okay, well, yeah. I yeah, I have kind of a unique history with jam for man. Is is we the the very first jam for man that they were. Uh, putting together for I believe eighty eight. It was in I think June I want to say June of eighty eight. Uh but I know it was in it was definitely in eighty eight. I actually uh believe it or not, I moved right before I moved away from Reston right before the first jam for me and I was I was so heartbroken because, you know, we were we were always playing, you know, parties and garage shows and everything and I, I always you know, as we kept on going as a band and everything, I you know, I started getting that taste. Like I, you know, uh, Dag Nasty's We Got a Denko's came out in '87, and then I was, you know, we were listening to uh, just all the stuff coming out on Discord. And by that time, non-Discord bands were were were, were getting big in the area, like Kingface and uh, Swizz was on uh, Samets, you know, and and just the whole area was kind of, at least in that area, it was just blowing up. And so I started thinking, you know, man, maybe we could put out, you know, we've got better at what we were doing and I was like maybe we could put out a record maybe we could play real shows so when they were you know when we heard about the whole jam for man getting organized and everything you know I I was I was excited about it but it turned out my you know unfortunately I was uh that summer I was finishing up 10th grade and uh my dad got uh got transferred and so I I was heartbroken I moved uh, it was probably May or April or May of 88, right before the first jam for me. And so Pat Kennedy, the, uh, or not Pat Kennedy, um, cause he was still obviously singing for minor cut. It was Bo, Bo Butler, you know, for a veil, Bobo. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, he, yeah. Yeah. He played, 
he played bass for my, for a hostile environment at the the first jam for man because I had just moved. So he had to learn all the songs and he played he played bass. So if, if I don't oh, know if there's man. Video, I don't know if there's video or audio or whatever, but that first Jam for Man show in in, in uh, the early summer '88, um, yeah, it was Bo Butler who uh, who played bass for Hostile Environment because I had I had just moved and like right before I moved, just a few weeks before I moved, that's when we got together in Brian Stewart's basement and Joe Banks. Uh, by that time, I think he had like an eight track realistic <laughs> mixer. You know, he he had graduated from four to eight, and uh, he, you know, Hostile Environment got together and we. We recorded uh, pretty much every song we knew, which was the demo that I sent you. The bulk of, uh, like, the first 75% of that was from that uh, in 88, right right before I moved. So, you know, it, it, it really sucked because I, I couldn't do Jam for Man, Bo play bass. And then I came, you know, I kept coming back to visit Reston. I would stay with uh, Jason Radley or I would stay with Ben or some other people. I would come back during the summer sometimes and then during Christmas time or whatever. And I would come and I'd hang out and play, you know, play with, play shows and stuff like that. But yeah, I came back after Jam for Man had happened, and you know, Pat was telling me all the stories about it, and he was showing me the the Jam for Man T-shirt and everything, and I was so depressed that I could not be part of that. So, so my my uh, my history with Jam for Man is is a, is a big history of regret that I could, you know, I I was you know I was there in spirit, you know, uh, all the people, all the you know. The people I knew were in it in a hostile environment, you know, my band was in it, but unfortunately I was not able to uh, to take place to take part of it. Well, so with those recordings, what did you guys wind up doing with them? Did you make um did you make covers? Did you make like how many copies of them did you make? We we did. Like, we what, made a what, lot. what did you do? Did did you sell them on consignment anywhere? <laughs> I don't think we ever sold them. I think we just we gave them away to as many people as we could. We, we uh, you know Pat definitely drew covers. There's one cover I, I, I'm sure I think Brian has a some of it, but it's like you know Pat came up with this idea of like a hand with fingers crossed, and then on the you know, top of the hand was the he you know for awesome environment. So. You know, we had covers and lyric sheets and tapes, you know, kind of like a, a lot of the tapes that would float around then, like Knotheads tape and uh, Slee Stacks and Avail and everything. And so, you know, we definitely had tons of tapes, gave them around to, to people and everything. I think we just gave them away for free, you know. And we, we we did a lot of other shows, you know, other than the house party shows. Like uh, we we opened up for Slee Stacks uh, a few times. We we played uh, at Gonzaga High School in uh, downtown D.C., which that was a crazy show, you know, Gonzaga. It was, uh, I don't know if it was a private school or it was like a Catholic private school. Yeah. Of, yeah. It was like, you know, people in uniforms and everything. And all of a sudden, you know, we roll in with sleeve stacks and it was like, it was a crazy show, you know, when, but it was, it was fun. I think I still have the flyer for that. I, I might have to send you the, uh, if, the, if you the, listen, the, if you listen to one of my other, um, podcasts, there's an episode with, uh, a guy named John T. Hastings. Who was in a okay. band called U? He was in a band called Utris, and um, the, all those guys actually went to Gonzaga High School. Uh, oh wow! In in the in the early to, to mid nineties, and uh, and Junkyard played their prom. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so that apparently cool. there's apparently there's a pretty good history of uh, of Virginia and DC bands playing at Gonzaga <laughs> High School. <laughs> they they wow. get the cream of the crop over there. Yeah, I don't even know how. You know, one day that was like uh, Sleep Facts were going to go play there, and they were like, "Hey, do you want to come open for us?" They asked us a couple of days ahead of time, and we were like, "Sure, when is it?" And they said, "Well, it's actually uh, in in the afternoon." And I'm like, well, that's during school. And they were like, yeah, we're all going to skip school. I'm like, uh, <laughs> oh, you know, okay. And so we met in the front of the school. And I think even one of the, the people out, you know, in the parking lot stopped us on our way out. And they were like, where are you guys going? And we're, you know, oh, we're, we're just, you know, going to go around. You know, I don't even know what we said. But, yeah, we went in a big van with sleep sacks to Gonzaga. And it was like an afternoon, you know, two or three o'clock show. It was, it was just weird. But, uh but yeah, it, it was great. So yeah, we we definitely had you know tapes and stuff like that. But we we never got to the point to where we were selling anything. You know, it was just to to pass around to friends and people and you know stuff like and that. I I think I sent one copy into uh, 
to Discord because I'm like, you know, you know how that's going to go. I'm going to send that in. They're going to say this is just awesome, and then we're going to put out an album on Discord. But yeah, <laughs> you, you, I'm sure you can guess how that went. You know. So there, but, but there was an effort then on on your behalf to to try to make it bigger, to try to you know get signed. Or at least signed there, by your your favorite label. Yeah, there by it was probably me and only me. You know, the rest of them were, you know, we were all enjoying ourselves and you know having fun playing the parties and stuff. I I am the kind of the one who was like, you know, I'd like this to, I'd like this this to be a thing. You know, I wasn't thinking like career or anything, but I was like, you know, I'd love to actually record something and and I would bring it up to the other guys and they they were. They were kind of just like, eh, you know, yeah, that'd be cool, whatever. But you know, they nothing ever really came of it. So I, you know, I I tried. I actually, uh, uh, we used to go to in Georgetown. We used to go to Smash a lot, Smash Records. Uh, ben and I and some friends would, you know, we'd skip school for the day and we we skate, literally skate DC. You know, you'd skate all through downtown, go to the Underground Mall, you know, uh, uh, skate on the Lincoln Memorial, that kind of thing, and we'd go to Smash and you know, hang out in Georgetown and everything. But but one day when I was up there, uh, I ran into uh, Sean Brown at Smash. And, uh, you know, I started bringing up our band and, you know, the whole wrestling thing or whatever. And he, uh, I don't know if he was just playing along, like he, he had heard of some wrestling bands or whatever, or if he'd actually heard of them. But, but he was kind of like, yeah, you know, I've heard about something about wrestling. And, I, you know, he mentioned a couple things or whatever. And so um, I got his number and I was going to, you know, give him a call and try and send him one of our demos to see if, you know, if we could get some kind of, like, third slot, you know, opening for Swizz, who would probably be opening for somebody else or whatever. And uh, and I, I called him, and I think I sent the demo tape to Sean, but I, I never heard anything from that point. And I, I kept telling you know, I'd tell Ben because we'd always hang out. I'd be like, you know, maybe maybe Sean's going to call back and maybe we're going to get on Discord. You know, I'm – I'm a 15, 16 year old kid, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking like this is going to lead to something. This is some big, big stuff. But it, you know, nothing ever, uh, nothing ever came of it. So yeah, I, I was definitely wanting to, to to push more and and do more. But it, but you know, it kind it kind of stayed just more of a a local thing. I I always tend to think that if I would have stayed in the area and uh, and kept on, you know, uh, either with hostile environment or something else, that that I would have been involved with. Which something that would have been put something out in a, a you know kind of a professional capacity there in DC because I, I moved to Texas in '88 and I went on to do things in Texas you know I'd, I I was in bands and put out CDs and stuff like that so you know I I did keep on that well, what, what are the ban- what are the bands and, and what were the CDs tell us well. Well, uh, there was a band called Split Decision, which there, you know, just like any good band name, there was a Split Decision in D.C. There was probably a Split Decision in every uh, uh, town in America. But I was in a band called Split Decision, and then uh, uh, apparently uh, the one there was a Reston one named Split Decision that was a go-go band. There were oh, like wow. the guys, the guys from Crunchy Water, wound up forming another go-go band called Split Decision. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, Split Decision is just one of those names. It's like Last Wish or, you know, whatever. There's there's 10 million bands. You know, Battery. You know, there's 10,000 bands that, you know, <laughs> yeah. love Metallica that, that name their band, that, you know, Battery. So, uh, but, but yeah, uh, I did, I put out some, we put out some stuff as, as Picnic Boy, but it was all, you know, it was all independent. We we're actually in, uh, in West Texas, kind of in the Lubbock, not that this means anything to you, but the, the Lubbock Midland area. Uh, we were, you know, we did some radio shows and stuff because there, that was back, you know, early nineties, like ninety, ninety one, when, you know, Nirvana was just, you know, Pearl Jam were just far, starting to, you know, hit big. So there was that big scramble to find, you know, anything that was alternative ish, you know, even, even if they didn't sound exactly like, you know, I mean, you recall there were bands getting signed like Shutter to Think and Jawbot, you know, that were, you know, moving, moving from Discord up to, Major labels and Sam I Am and you know, it, you know even Bad Religion went from Epitaph to Atlantic and it was that was just a crazy time. So like all these, you know, bands that were maybe punk but had like an alternative flavor to them. They were they were they they were getting interest and so 
you know, I was in some bands that got some interest, definitely did, you know, demos and, and CDs and stuff. Um, you know, we, what, what was your big hit song? <laughs> I, you know, there, we, we had some, when I was in a uh, split decision and then we changed our name to picnic boy, which I, I still have no idea where that came from, but we did uh two, two CDs. The first CD was like a six song EP and the second CD was like a, it was about the same five or six songs. And it, it's funny, the shift because the first one, I was kind of still in, in kind of punk mode. I was really big into, you know, starting out with Dag Nasty and then moving on to like Descendants and All and those those sorts of things. So it's like you, you hear the, the the music stayed pretty good, you know, a very fast paced, you know, hardcore type stuff. But the, the lyrics started shifting from, you know, uh, ranting about society to, uh, you know, talking about does the girl down the street like me kind of a thing, you know. you'll get a good there's even some stuff in there that is even a little bit metal ish you know in 87 88 when guns and roses you know everything was everything was kind of influencing everything you had a lot of bands that were like punk but then they were like metal and then they were like alternative like mind funk you know i don't know if you ever listen to mind funk with it had the uh the uh, singer from uh, uh it was pat uh what's his name uh from uniform choice and uh he did this band called Mind Funk with uh, the ex guitar player from Nirvana, and they did like funky metal. It was it was crazy. It was before he did like some of his insane clown posse stuff or whatever. <laughs> I mean that that guy really went off the rails. But but it's just funny how a lot of bands like even Uniform Choice. You know, you listen to that first uh, uh, Screaming for Change album, and it's very minor threadish, and it's like wow, this is really awesome. And then their next album, Staring into the Sun for uh, Giant Records, was it was like metal. It was a you know a little hardcoreish, but it was it was metal, you know. And they all had long hair and stuff, so it was really interesting. All the bands that kind of shifted, like even Dag Nasty. So so, you know, pic, they, so Picnic Boy shifted then, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There, there's at the end of the the, the uh, our second uh, uh, EP, you'll definitely hear a couple metal metal ish songs you know that i'm not exactly proud of but it, they're fun to listen to <laughs> hey man there's there's a lot of a lot of music in my back catalog that i don't necessarily stand by <laughs> but you know it's still, yeah it, it's, it's out there and you know you uh yep. you you develop as an artist over time you know and and, and, and sometimes you have to you have to go down some some blind alleys to, to find and, the good stuff, and a lot of bands that were that were out for years and stuff, they all went through shifts. Like Seven Seconds, you know, you listen to some of the later albums, like Second Wind and everything. They sound like U2, you know, and that, or you have like a, a you know DYS with Dave Smalley, you know, the, the you know the, before the KSA album when he was in a DYS, he did a Wolf Pack, and that's a great album. And then you listen to the DYS's second album, and it's it's all metal too, and. You know, everyone went through shifts, even Circle Jerks and, uh, you know, uh, even Adolescents to a certain degree. They kind of went metal-ish, you know, in their, their later days and stuff. So it's, it's, it is it's it is all these bands that were around for a number of years. They all seem to go through their, you know, their fads kind of a thing. Well, so um, 
do you still – did you keep in touch with the guys from Hostile Environment after you moved to Texas? And do you know what became of, of those guys and what yeah, became yeah, of, I, of them I musically? Do. Yeah, I did for a while. You know, Ben uh, Ben still plays the drums, but he uh, he and I just reconnected recently. But I, I did stay in touch with him into the '90s and stuff. But he he moved to Atlanta, where his uh, his uh, his dad lived, and he uh, he he still drummed and everything. But he kind of you know he 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 went into banking and insurance and stuff, and now he owns his own uh, uh, painting and construction company, Pat. Pat did like um, the construction on movie sets, and now he owns his own construction company in Virginia. And the the funniest one is is Jason. So you, you <laughs> the, uh, Jason Radley, you know, he was our guitar player, and you know, he was a he was a big uh, classic rock guy. You know, uh, it indulged a little in uh, you know some of some of the, the the herbal extremities and everything. And he is funny. You know, I, I always was curious what what he was going to wind up doing, and. Uh, and I, we just recently reconnected, and he, he's actually, uh, he went to uh, Harvard, and graduated with like a, a doctorate in uh, neuroscience, and he actually heads the, the neuroscience division at University of Ohio. It's like the Jason Radley Neurosciences Division, <laughs> and he, nice. you know, he's the head of the department, and he's like, he publishes all these papers and stuff you know, about uh, neuroscience and everything, and the, the study of the brain and everything. It's, it's just. You know, it's just insane. You know, that, that could be a good idea for like a documentary sometime about, you know, uh, what all these uh, old, you know, punk rock guys eventually did with their lives. And it's it's, it's surprising to, to, you know, like Brian uh, Stewart, you know, he became a teacher and, you know, I never thought he'd be married with kids and everything. Uh, a funny story about Brian, I, I have to tell you this, because, you know, Brian and I have reconnected over the years and, you know, I mean, you've talked to him with the podcast and everything. He's a great guy and um, very, you know, it, it just music's been his life and everything. But the funny, the funny story I have on Brian Stewart is the very first time I met him, it was like '86, and I was hanging out with Ben in front of Highs. You know, every every good story in Houston starts with Highs, and uh, we're we're in front of Highs, and Brian comes up and he's hanging with with some other guys. I don't know who it was. And, you know, we're all talking about music and this and that and everything. And then um, I'm about to leave, and I, I, I'm i pretty sure it was a piece of gum. I had just put a piece of gum in my mouth, and I took the wrapper. And, you know, I'm a I'm a 15-year-old kid, you know. It, it, I could have cared less about the environment at the time, you know, unfortunately. And I just – you, you were hostile to the environment. Yeah, I was. I was very hostile to <laughs> the environment. But I threw the, the the wrapper from the piece of gum on the ground. You know, I just chucked it. Didn't throw it in the trash can. I just threw it on the ground. And Brian Stewart actually turned around and he spit in my face. He was like, <laughs> he was he was he was just so incensed that I had just littered. And and that was the that was the funny thing about Brian is he you know he was punk through and through. But he also had this huge, like, moral streak, you know, which is why I was, you know, when you hear stories about him stealing all those milk crates, building the stage, and then returning them, you know, that was Brian. It was like, you know, he did whatever he needed to do to get, get the job done, but he was he was moral about it, you know. Yeah, my, my big idea, and uh, we're probably running out of time here, but my big idea, and I, I floated this to Brian about a year ago. And uh, it, it even didn't gain traction, or maybe just there wasn't, uh, you know, the people couldn't participate or whatever. But my big idea was, you know, 88 to uh, to uh, 2018, you know, 30th anniversary of the first jam. Man, my idea was is we should see how many of the old Reston guys we could get back to Reston and do a jam for man, and like the bands could all play together again, or maybe. You know, uh, there could be a core band and people sit in with them and they do a bunch of the songs from the old days or whatever. So that that was my big idea. It didn't it didn't seem to work out or whatever. But actually, uh, uh, sent Brian a, a text. A few we days still ago we still got time. Twenty twenty eighteen's only only halfway through. You know, so or we, we could just... do a thirty or we could do a thirty first anniversary because you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, Guns N' Roses just came out with their you know their Appetite for Destruction. Uh, 
you know, four CD remaster, you know, demo thing or whatever. And it's 31 years after it came out. So, I mean, <laughs> you, you, can, you can, you can do 31. So, yeah, that's when my, that's my whenever big idea. Whenever the last in community center is available, that's when yeah. we'll, <laughs> we'll be able to yeah. put it on. <laughs> or we could just do it somewhere, you know, we could just do it somewhere else. But yeah, I actually texted Brian a couple of days ago, I told him, uh, I was going to give him a call. I still haven't called him. Uh, I was going to call him this weekend to let him get you kind of float my idea that we, you know we, we should do something like that. I mean that would that, that would be that awesome. is a that is a great great idea. And, and uh, if someone could actually know, video it with like quality, you know, these days it doesn't take much more to be quality more quality than it was in the eighties. You could do it with an iPhone and it would still look spectacular. But you could video it or you know whatever or just. Definitely. You know, we, oh, we didn't record oh, definitely. it. Yeah. Make, get all make, the, like, the, the t-shirts, make the posters. Yeah. yeah you sell, get all sell, the non- sell the old tape. Yep. Get the non-head it, guys it, together. The transilience, crunchy water, hostile environment. You know, it sounds, from oh, what I, Ryan said, it sounds like LDK. You know, that's kind of iffy. You know, of course, Andy's not with us anymore. But, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, just whoever, you know, it, it would be, that'd be awesome. If nothing else, um, you know, I, I'm trying to do my part, and I hope to uh, to interview pretty much everybody that that played uh, in the original Jam for Man uh, concert, and right. I will fl- I will float the idea now to, to every single uh, person and find out whether they're interested. There you go. I'm I'm I'm, I'm serious. You know, un- unfortunately. I'm like the guy, you know, there, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy. His name is Jason. You, you just want to finally be able to play a jam for man. I think I that's do. what that, this whole thing is about. <laughs> I do. I, I am the Jason Everman of, of rest and hardcore. You know, he's, he's this guy. I read an article in Rolling Stone about him. Great, interesting read. But he was the second guitarist in Nirvana. And right before, I, I believe he's on Bleach. He played on Bleach. And right before they, you know, we're gonna, uh, they did the tour right before they recorded Nevermind and everything. They they dumped him, and so then, so then, so okay, he misses out on Nevermind, you know, which that's huge in and of itself. So then he joins Soundgarden, and he's their sec or third guitarist, uh, and then they dump him right before they got onto A and M Records and recorded. Uh, it was either Ultra Mega, okay, or no, that was what that's. But it was right before Soundgarden broke big with, you know, Outshined and, uh, you know, their big album on uh, A&M Records. And so this, this guy, it was it was interesting. This article was all about, like, all the near misses of, like, classic bands that he had been he had been in and then, you know, left right before they hit it big. So that, that's kind of like me, you know. It was like, uh, you know, I almost made it to the jam for man, and then, you know, I, I, I was gone right before it happened, so... All right, well, we're, we're going to have to make it happen so that you can play a jam for men, finally, Matt. <laughs> finally, after all this time. Well, li- listen, I really appreciate you coming on. I-, I thank you so much for your time and-, and all these stories and everything. It's been really great. You, uh, Your knowledge of music is impeccable, and, uh, and I'm going to have to go back, and when I listen through all of this, this is make a, a <laughs> list of all of these albums that you've referenced. Go so check out virtually all of them. You know, and, and I, 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 hope, I hope other people are going to deep dive and do the same thing. You know, I, you know, I've got a lot of crazy stories about. Maybe we could do a part two sometime of of us all just jumping into a car and driving down to the nine thirty show, um, going to see. You know, we saw a show with Jack Nasty, and the opening bands were Swizz and Kingface. I mean, that's that's a killer show. And I had a I had a tape recorder down my pants, and I recorded the whole show. So I got that. I can see those files. You know, I, I've got a lot of good stories about uh, those days. I can kind of go on and on and on and on about. Well, you 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 told us plenty for this one episode, and, uh, <laughs> and we we definitely we definitely should do another one. I would love to have you back. And All right, uh, sounds good. I, I I just really appreciate you you taking the time to talk to me. And to, no problem. To share, to share your love of uh, of Northern Virginia and DC music with us, yeah, I, it's just great. Yeah, I, well, I really appreciate it. I, I love the uh, the whole idea of the podcast you're doing, and you know, 
those were good times. So any anytime uh anytime I get to talk about them is a good good time. Well, keep listening, man. You're going to be surprised by some of the people that, that you hear from and uh, and some of these bands. And then mm-hmm. some that you've never heard of before could be uh, pleasant surprises, too. So I hope you'll, you'll keep listening uh, as oh, well yeah. as coming back. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. All right, man, great to talk to you. Thank you so much. All right, uh, thank talk you. Again soon. All right, All right. All right. bye.